Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to this morning's presentation uh, from the Aging Well series, uh, Aging of the Eyes, Macular Degeneration, and Cataracts. Uh, welcome, Dr. Schwartz, and thank you for presenting with us today. Uh, let me give you a, a little background on Dr. Schwartz. Um, Dr. Schwartz is a professor of clinical ophthalmology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and Medical Director of Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in Naples, which he has led since its opening in 2004. He's a board certified ophthalmologist and a fellowship trained retina specialist. He's a past president of the Florida Society of Ophthalmology and serves on the board of directors of Lighthouse of Collier. Dr. Schwartz is a graduate of Cornell University New York University School of Medicine and Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. He completed his residency training, New York University, fellowship training at Baylor College of Medicine and the leadership development program of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few of the rules of gathering for this morning. Uh, Dr. Schwartz will present for 45 to 60 minutes. We'll follow that with a 30 to 45 minute question and answer period. Well, questions will be answered after the presentation. Please feel free to ask your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen at any time through the presentation. And as moderator, I will share them with the speaker at the end of the presentation. There'll be a very short survey at the end of the program that greatly influ influences the future Aging Well series uh, uh, presentations. The Aging Well Committee relies on your input and greatly appreciates your feedback. So please take the time to answer the survey. This presentation will be, is being recorded and will be available on the church's YouTube channel indefinitely. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Schwartz. Dr. Right. Schwartz. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Especially thank you to Dr. Bob Norland for inviting me to give this talk in the first place. And I'm delighted to uh, speak with you today. All right. So hopefully everybody can see the title slide. Uh, and, the, and the title I was given, it's called Aging Well, Aging of the Eyes, Macular Degeneration and Cataracts. And we've got about 45 minutes to go through this. And, you know, ordinarily we would do this uh, live and in person and be able to have uh, interaction during the, during the talk. So we'll, we'll try to do the best we can with this. But uh, I look forward to your questions, which will probably be, be more fun so, you know, sort of like the serendipity prayer where we, you know, we, we, we seek the strength to change the things we can and the serenity to accept the things we can't. There are uh, causes of visual loss that are potentially correctable versus not potentially correctable. So, you know, hard to believe, but still the number one cause of blindness worldwide is cataract. Uh, and this is a correctable cause of visual loss, you know, far greater than 99% of patients who have cataract surgery come out of it better than when they went in. And we're very lucky to live in a place where there's lots and lots of cataract surgeons and getting cataract surgery really isn't very difficult. But there are large parts of the world, especially in the developing world, where there really isn't any way to get cataract surgery. And to this day, you know, the last estimate I read was 30 million blinds worldwide from cataracts, which you know, I'll, I'll show you a video of a cataract surgery later in the talk today. It's, it's it, the, the, the fact that, that something that straightforward and that quick can't get to millions and millions of people should give us pause and, you know, reinforce how lucky we are to live where we are. So in the U.S., the number one uh, cause of visual loss is not cataract. The number one cause of permanent visual loss in the U.S., among the elderly and among other developed nations is a disease called age-related macular degeneration. 
and we can often help age-related macular degeneration, but not everybody gets better, and that's why that gets put in the, in the non-correctable category. So let's, uh, let's present them sort of in reverse order, since I'm a macular degeneration specialist, and that's, uh, that's what I know about. So if you think of the eye like a camera, not like a phone camera, but an old fashioned camera that a lot of us had growing up, sort of a box with a lens in the front and the film in the back. Well, the eye is built like that too. Actually, it's probably the other way around. The camera's built more like a human eye is built with the lens in the front and the film in the back. And when the lens gets cloudy, we call that a cataract. But even if the lens is totally clear, if the film is damaged, then there won't be good vision. And the film is called the retina. And the very center of the retina has a special name called the macula. So the very center of the film inside the camera is called the macula. And the macula is responsible for very fine detailed vision, color vision, reading small prints. So people without a macula or with uh, macular damage, and there are, there are plenty of diseases that can damage the macula other than age-related macular degeneration. But people with macular diseases typically don't bump into things. They typically don't need to have a white stick and a dog, but you can see in the, in the simulation here that it's very hard to recognize faces. It's very hard to read small prints. It, it pretty much makes driving not possible. So it's a, it's a very disabling problem to have. And again, this is the leading cause of irreversible visual loss among the elderly in the U.S. and in other industrialized nations. Well, that's sort of a funny word, macula, right? Where, where does that word come from? And if, again, if this were a, a standard talk, I would pause and I would solicit questions from the audience. So just kind of think in your head if you know what the word macula means. So I took this photo at, uh, this, is at the, uh, this is at the Collier County History Museum, which is near the government complex on Airport Pulling Road on the East Trail. And in that Collier County Museum, there's a little fishing cabin in the back. And if you go in the fishing cabin, there's trophies up on the wall. And I saw this and I just knew I had to have a picture of it. So this is the Spanish mackerel. So whether the word mackerel uh, comes from the word macula or not is is actually uh, is actually debated. Some people say yes, some people say no. But the Latin name of the fish, the scientific name of the fish, is Scomboramorus maculatus. So you can see that maculatus right there. So clearly, that's the same macula as the macula in the eye. And the reason why the fish is called a macula and the eye is called a macula is macula is a Latin word for spots. And that's why you see macula in other words, like immaculate, right? Which is uh, literally means spotless. So, you know, I, I'll grant you that this fish doesn't seem to have a whole lot of spots, maybe one or two there, but that's, that's the name of the fish. The macula is actually short for a Latin expression, macula lutea. Macula lutea literally means yellow spots. And I've given this talk to a lot of different audiences uh, both medical off, uh, audiences, scientific audiences, and lay audiences over the last 15 years or so. And, you know, more often than not, people, people don't know that that's where the word macula came from. But interestingly enough, if any of you have children or grandchildren that go to Mason Classical Academy here in Naples, I gave a version of this talk to the fourth grade class at Mason Classical Academy maybe eight or nine years ago. And those kids all were taught Latin by the fourth grade and they all knew macula lutea. So there used to be an old TV show, are you smarter than a fourth grader? So here's, here's how you can test yourself. But anyway, macula lutea is the name that was given to this part of the retina. Uh, it's really not a yellow spot in life, but long before there was the ability to look inside an eye with a dilated pupil or to take a photograph of the inside of the eye, it was possible to remove an eye at autopsy in a deceased patient and look inside the eye. And this doesn't happen in life, but in death, always the retina detaches, which is what you're seeing along the, along the edge here, the, the, the blood vessels, the white part seems to scroll up, but then right in the middle, this is sort of a yellow picture. So the very first person that ever looked inside an eye from an autopsy specimen said, oh, there's a yellow spot. And 
I don't know what the yellow spot means, but maybe it's important. We've been stuck with that name ever since. So that's what the macula is. It just means spots in the center of the retina. But it's always nice to include a cartoon in a medical talk. And this is the only cartoon I've got. Uh, this cartoon is from 1915. This ran in newspapers across the country. I got this cartoon incidentally from a company called Newsbank. Some of you are saying, I've, I know where Newsbank is. I've driven by it. It's, it's walking distance from the church. It's on 41, a little north of, uh, a little north of Seagate Drive in the, in the Pelican Bay Shopping Center. But they're a, a company that maintains newspaper archives. And I got this from their archives. And if, if you can't read the little print, there's a, there's a little guy in a sailor suit on the left there. And he says, oh, boss, your glasses may be busted. But I found a book that tells you how to cure poor eyesight. Look here in the young deterioration of the macula is rapid upon the first manifestation of the squints. And whether or not you want to read the rest of the cartoon and whether or not you think this is funny, this was the word macula in a newspaper cartoon that went out to the general public 106 years ago. And then you could ask yourself, you know, would a, would, would a modern newspaper that runs cartoons today think that it would be worth putting the word macula in a, in a daily cartoon? So that's the word macula. Maybe that's more than you really wanted to know, but I, I think it's interesting to know where words come from. So who gets macular degeneration? Well, again, like we talked about correctable and non-correctable, there are things we can do something about, and there are things we really can't do something about. So macular degeneration has both modifiable, meaning present, uh, potentially correctable versus non-modifiable risk factors. And it doesn't mean that if you have many risk factors, you'll definitely get macular degeneration. And it doesn't mean that if you don't have any risk factors, that you definitely won't get macular degeneration. But you can kind of see that having more risk factors is not as good as having fewer risk factors. So the two biggest modifiable risk factors are smoking and nutrition. And I think smoking is less common than it used to be, but clearly smoking makes macular degeneration worse. Um, if you needed yet another reason to cut down on your smoking or even better stop the smoking, you know, uh, increasing your risk of not getting macular degeneration should help that. And in nutrition, it's very clear there's certain vitamins and minerals that get obtained through the diet that seem to affect whether or not you get this potentially blinding disease. Then, of course, we've got non-modifiable risk factors. So age, not much that, that we can do about that, right? Uh, I, I would say keep looking for the fountain of youth. It's supposed to be around here somewhere. But clearly, the older people are, the more likely they are to get this disease. Clearly, there's a, a family history components. Uh, this is a disease that seems to run in families, but it never quite maps out to a genetic inheritance pattern, you can never quite do what they call a pedigree analysis. So it's not like we can really tell you based on the parents and the grandparents if you're going to get macular degeneration or not. Uh, that's because it's a complicated genetic disease. So there are diseases that we know for a fact that there's a normal gene and if you have the normal gene, you won't get the disease. And there's an abnormal gene and we call that a mutation. And if you have the mutation, you will get the disease. Macular degeneration is not like that. So it's not like Tay-Sachs disease or cystic fibrosis. There are, last time anybody checked, about 50 different gene variants across 30 or 40 different genes. And they all mix together. Some of them make more risk, some of them make less risk. Uh, scientists have been looking for many, many years to find some sort of master algorithm, some master math formula to put the genetic data with the age and the family history and smoking and nutrition, but nobody's got it yet. So this is why, uh, because the genetics are not clear and still under active study, genetic screening for macular degeneration never really went anywhere. It never really panned out. So we divide macular degeneration into two categories, one which is called dry, one which is called wet. This is very confusing terminology, but we've been using it for decades and it's not going anywhere. So we have to learn it. This is not the same as dry eye, which is a very, very common disease, especially among older people where the surface of the eye becomes dry. What we mean here is that wet is euphemism for bleeding. 
And wet's about 20% of the patients with this disease. This usually comes on acutely or suddenly, and it accounts for most of the bad visual outcomes. Well, if it's not wet, then it's got to be dry, even though that, that term doesn't really make sense. Dry is a more slow-moving, insidious disease. Maybe 80% or four-fifths of patients will have dry disease. Again, most of the bad vision loss and bad outcomes come from wet disease. Although some patients with bad dry disease, if it goes on long enough, will reach an, an irreversible point of severe visual loss. So this advanced dry disease is an emerging problem. And it's frustrating because we don't really have a treatment for it. The picture on the right of the slide, some of you have seen something like this in the past. This is called an Amsler grid named for Dr. Amsler who was the first to, to create a chart like this. The lines are all supposed to be straight, meeting each other at right angles, like at the edges. Uh, it's been known for centuries now that macular disease in the eye, as opposed to other diseases in the eye, will account for what's called distortion. Straight lines will look bending or curving or waving. So as opposed to cataract or glaucoma or other eye disease, Distortion, or straight lines not looking straight anymore, is an early indication of macular disease. And this is why many, many eye doctors will give something like this to their patients. So obviously, it's not supposed to look like that curvy, bending, waving area. And if that changes or becomes worse, that's a good reason to call your eye doctor promptly. <clears throat> All right. So... Macular degeneration is interesting for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons it's interesting is it's one of the few diseases in any area of medicine, in any body part, that vitamins have been rigorously studied and shown to be beneficial. In the, not the prevention, but in the risk reduction in the disease. So a specific combination of vitamins that became known as the age-related eye disease study, or AREDS clinical formula, was shown in a randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial to reduce progression rates over about five years. So what that means is, if you were in this clinical trial and you took the vitamins as opposed to not taking the vitamins, you had less chance of progressing either to wet macular degeneration or bad dry macular degeneration over the five years of the study. Again, this doesn't mean prevention, but it means risk reduction. It means that if you want to do everything you can to hold off vision loss from macular degeneration and you already have the disease and these vitamins are important, uh, if you really don't have any disease at all, the vitamins were not shown to be beneficial. So purely preventive use of these vitamins in completely healthy, normal patients doesn't seem to be beneficial. But if you have at least what they call intermediate dry disease, then this is important and this is something you should take. And the one I'm showing is the original formula from a company called Bausch & Lohm, but there's many, many competitors on the market. You certainly don't have to use this one. But this is the AREDS 2, which is really the, the preferred one at this point. It's a combination of lutein, which is an A vitamin. And again, lutein is yellow like lutea. Lutein, zeaxanthine, vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, and copper. That's the AREDS 2 formula. So now we're going to learn another difficult phrase, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor. So that's abbreviated as VEGF or VEGF, VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. This is a chemical. This is sort of like a hormone, but not really. It's made by different cells in your body. It's responsible for growing abnormal new blood vessels in wet macular degeneration. So the new blood vessels can't grow without a chemical signal called VEGF. And one of the great advances in the last 15 to 20 years of this specialty is the introduction of multiple anti-VEGF drugs, right? So these drugs block VEGF. If you block VEGF, you block the chemical signal that causes the blood vessels to grow. There are a few caveats. There are a few warnings about these. You probably know people that are getting anti-VEGF treatment. It's usually given by an injection in the doctor's office. The treatment only works for wet disease. There is no specific treatment available for dry disease. And it really only works for acute or active or new disease. Eyes that have had disease for many, many years without treatment typically progress to a scar. By the time you get to a scar, it's probably not going to respond to anti-VEGF treatment anymore. 
And finally, vision may get worse over time in spite of anti-VEGF treatment. This is usually because the patients also have dry disease at the same time. But for patients with active wet macular degeneration, which used to be an untreatable, very bad problem to have, these anti-VEGF drugs have done a lot of good, especially in the last 15 years. And there are really five of them, although pegaptinib, which is macogen, is no longer available. That was the very first one. It was beaten out by the other ones. There was a brand new one called B of U or brolicizumab that was FDA approved late 2019, but it was found to have many, many side effects and very few doctors use it now. So the three big ones that get used a lot are called a flibercept or ILEA, ranibizumab or lucentis, and bevacizumab or avastin. In the US and around the world, more bevacizumab or avastin is given than all other drugs put together because it's very, very inexpensive. So it doesn't matter if you have good health insurance or if the diagnosis code doesn't quite match. It's a very easy drug for doctors to use. All right, so Dr. Harry Flynn at Bascom Palmer in Miami loaned me this video. And this is how the drug is given. It's given on a very, very tiny needle injected into the white of the eye, which you can see right there. This is really very well tolerated. It's a very small amount of drug given with local anesthesia. You can see the patient really seems to be handling this very well. That was the whole thing. So let's show it again, just so you can get another sense of it. Typically the eye undergoes a prep with anesthetic eye drops, dilute iodine solution to sterilize the surface of the eye. And that little metal clip is called a speculum. It's used to hold the eyelids out of the way. So that's an anti-VEGF injection. Um, some of you may have known somebody who's had an anti-VEGF injection. This is something that we never did before about 15 years ago, but we do a lot of it now. And, and to the point where this is the number one procedure that I personally do. All right, so there are two unanswered questions about the anti-VEGF drug. And I've had a version of this slide in this talk for again, about the last 15 years, and these answers haven't, these questions haven't changed, which means they haven't been answered, right? Which is the best drug of the drugs that are available? So originally, the only two drugs available were Avastin and Lucentis, but now Ilea and B of you have come along. So, you know, which is the best drug, and how often do you have to get these injections done? So in other words, which is the best drug to use, and how often should they be used? And the answer is nobody really knows. All of these drugs can be given as often as once a month. Most patients don't need it more often than once a month, but many, many patients can have them done less often, every two months, every three months. Most patients with wet macular degeneration need to keep getting injections for many, many years, potentially forever, but everybody's a little different. And we have very good clinical trial data to guide us knowing that patients with new wet macular degeneration that have never been treated before should be offered anti-VEGF therapy. But does it really matter which drug you get? Does it really matter how often you get it? Maybe less important. So because of this, every individual doctor has his or her own preferred practice pattern. And then because we live in Naples, Florida, there are a lot, a lot of patients that are snowbirds that, that have a doctor up north and a doctor in Florida. And the doctor up north may have a different opinion of how to treat than the doctor in Florida. And this is why it seems confusing. So if you know people that are getting these injections that are confused by, should I have this drug or that drug? Should I get injected every month? Should I get injected every two months? Don't feel bad because the medical profession hasn't totally answered these two questions either. This is very individual. This is worth a conversation with the doctor in detail. But the answer is that if you have wet, active, age-related macular degeneration, these drugs will help a lot of people. And with that, we'll move on to cataracts. So not everybody 
listening to this talk is going to get macular degeneration. Probably most people listening to this talk will never get macular degeneration. And if they get it, they'll only get it when they're much, much older. But cataracts is almost universal. It's almost ubiquitous. I would say most people listening to this talk will need to have cataract surgery at some point in their life. Uh, the major reason why somebody never gets cataract surgery, unfortunately, would be if they died of something young and they never needed the cataract surgery. But cataracts are, again, universally ubiquitous, hard to evade. So a cataract, like we talked about, is a clouding of the lens in the front of the eye. So the lens in the front of the eye has one job in life, and that's to stay clear. And if for any reason it can't stay clear, we call that a cataract. And obviously the vision gets very blurry if not enough light can get into the eye. So what does the word cataract mean? And again, if we were doing this talk live in a normal year, uh, I would ask for a show of hands, see if anybody's ever heard the expression cataracts of the Nile, right? Cataracts of the Nile River, which is, you don't hear that much, but that's usually the, the context that you hear this in and they, they don't mean eyes. So cataract is a Greek term for a waterfall. And here's the prettiest picture of a waterfall I could find. I don't think it's on the Nile, but what I wanna draw your attention to is where the waterfall hits the water at the bottom. It's sort of a bluish white color. That's the churn of the water. And most waterfalls that you see will, will have that color at some point of it, that bluish white color where the water churns, right? When it hits the bottom. And what does that have to do with an eye? Well. In ancient times, if cataracts got very, very, very bad, they would turn to that color. And even nowadays, you can see very advanced cataracts that should have had surgery many years ago, but didn't for whatever reason, will turn that same sort of whitish, bluish color. And what you're seeing here, courtesy of my colleague, Dr. Alistair Gibbons, is a surgical photograph of a patient with what we call a white cataract. And you can see why it's called white cataract, because it's almost as white as the rest of the eye. And it really has a striking resemblance to the, the bluish white churn at the bottom of the waterfall. So this is a white cataract. Most patients, at least in the US, will have their cataract surgery done much, much before this stage, before it turns white. So kind of like the word macula, it doesn't really make sense anymore, but it's the word that we're stuck with and it's the word we're gonna keep using. So these are diagrams of where the cataract is in the eye and of the structure of the cataract. So the picture on the left is as if the patient is lying on his or her back with the top of the eye pointed up towards the ceiling and the bottom of the eye with the macula pointing down towards the floor. And the iris, which is the colored part, covers most of the lens. It's like the diaphragm of a camera, it regulates how much light gets in. And you can see the lens in the back. And what I like to tell the patients is that you can think of a cataract or you can think of a normal human lens as roughly the same size and shape and organization as an M&M candy. Not the peanut M&M, but the regular chocolate M&M. So most people can sort of picture that in their mind, the size of an M&M and the fact that it's not really totally spherical like a baseball. It's sort of flat and squished, but more or less round. And like an M&M, there's a shell on the outside and there's stuff in the middle, right? So an M&M, the, the candy shell on the outside, in the cataract, we call a capsule. And that holds all the stuff in the middle inside. And in a regular M&M, all you really have is chocolate, but in a human lens, there's an inner, inner stuff, we call that the nucleus, and sort of an outer inner stuff that we call the cortex. But again, think of this like an M&M, &M, and when I show you the surgical video in a few minutes, it'll make more sense. Again, the lens is very small. So this is a photograph taken from the old days when lenses were physically removed from the eye during cataract surgery in one piece. And to show you the size of it, it's right next to the end of a ballpoint pen. So the tip of the ballpoint pen to the left and the cataract to the right. This cataract's more of a brownish tinge to it. So not as advanced as a white cataract, certainly. But again, more or less the same size 
and shape and general organizational structure as an M&M. Here, courtesy of Dr. Alistair Gibbons at our place in Naples is a video, a real-time video of a real patient having cataract surgery. So I'll walk you through it. We'll do it a second time. So here we go. That's the first incision into the eye. That's just so you can get the instruments in and out. So this is a, uh, this is a little bit of fluid and the fluid's being done to sort of keep the eye inflated, if that makes sense. Here's the larger incision. This is opening the front part of the capsule. So this is sort of like opening the front of the candy shell of the M&M, leaving everything else intact. Right, so now the front of the hard candy shell is opened. Here's a little liquid being used to try to separate the shell from the chocolate underneath, so separating the nucleus of the cortex from the capsule underneath. And a surgeon can usually tell when that separation is complete because the lens will rotate, the lens will spin freely inside the capsule. So the larger instrument is called FACO, P-H-A-C-O. This is an ultrasound. This is being done. It, it disintegrates and grinds up and sucks out or aspirates the little pieces of the lens. And when you've got sort of a groove, you can break it in half and spin it around again, which you can see. Here's a second pass. Broke one of the halves into two quarters. And once they're that size, they can usually be removed from the eye through the FACO probe. So this is the nucleus going away. So this is, that's a quarter of the nucleus is gone, really a half of the nucleus is gone. And here's the other half, broken in half. And that's the last little bit of the nucleus or the inner inner part of the chocolate there's still a little stuff left over and that's what the cortex is. So that's removing the cortex, which is the last little bits of chocolate from the inside of the candy shell. But the capsule or the shell is mostly intact other than the hole in the front that lets all the instruments go in and out. Now the lens has to be replaced. You can't leave the eye without a lens. So here's where the lens implant will go in. That's a little fluid to inflate the space. The lens implant is rolled up and it fits in that tiny little opening. And then it unrolls almost like a taco shell unrolling. And if you get it in the right place, it more or less unrolls itself. That's cleaning out all the fluids that were used to do the surgery while the lens unrolls itself. And no sutures are being used. That's just a little bit of liquid used to so-called hydrate the wounds, cause a little swelling at the edge of the wound so it seals by itself. And really that was the surgery. So I know that's overwhelming, especially for people who don't know what they're looking at. So we'll do it one more time so that everybody can see it again. And this time you can sort of pay more attention to the details. <clears throat> but again, keep thinking of the M&M, the candy shell, and the chocolate in the middle. And 
So again, that's just a little liquid to inflate the eye to keep it from collapsing while there's holes in it. That's the incision. That's opening the front of the shell. The technical term for that is capsulorexis. Capsulorexis. That's a little fluid to separate the nucleus and cortex from the edge of the capsule or separating the chocolate from the shell. That's carving a trench along the nucleus so that you can split the nucleus in half and spin it around. That broke one of the halves into two quarters. So now half the nucleus is out. That broke the second half into two quarters, three quarters out. And that's what's left of the nucleus. So again, there's some scraps of residual material called cortex, which is like the rest of the the little bits of chocolate along the inside of the candy shells, so all that really has to go. That gets peeled out. That's a little more liquid to open up the shell to make a place for the lens implant to go in. The lens implant goes in, rolled up on itself, almost like a taco. And it unrolls itself. And a set of sutures, this is called hydrating the wound, which is literally just injecting a little fluid at the edge of the incisions and creates a little swelling and that usually closes by itself over the next few days. So they say the greatest compliment you can pay to a surgeon is that he or she made it look easy. And, and really, you know, this video is, is kind of an amazing thing. It really does make it look very straightforward, but it is very uh, precise, technically detailed surgery. And again, thank you to my colleague, Dr. Alistair Gibbons for allowing me to show the film. Well, there we go. So this is our place in Naples. It's been my pleasure to talk to you today. We're finishing just a little early, but that's okay. We'll have lots of time for questions and answers. But that's uh, everything you wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask about macular degeneration and cataracts in 37 minutes or less. And I thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Dr. Schwartz. This has been a, a, a great presentation. Um, let's look at um, some of the questions that we have. Uh, uh, first of all, what specific vitamins and minerals promote good eye health 
uh, one of the modifiers of risk factors. Right. So that, that's a little bit of a difficult question. Uh, you'll notice that when you, when you talk to doctors about vitamins, they, they sometimes they, they sometimes pause like I'm pausing now and collect their thoughts. And, and the problem is not, I mean, not that I could speak for all, you know, million or so doctors in the United States, but the, the, the main issue is clearly vitamins, minerals, nutritional supplements are powerful and people have been using them for thousands and thousands of years before there were doctors. But doctor's advice tends to be given uh, based on medical evidence. The very best medical evidence in the 21st century is, is a clinical trial. And the truth is most vitamins and minerals and supplements haven't been through a clinical trial. So it's very hard for us to make recommendations based on lower levels of evidence. So the AREDS combination, age-related eye disease study, is one of the very few supplements in any area of medicine that really went through the same level clinical testing that a pharmaceutical product would go through. And that's why when I tell you that the AREDS, or better yet, the AREDS 2 combination uh, slows progression rates for patients with intermediate age-related macular degeneration, that's because I've got a clinical trial to back that up. Now, most other areas of ophthalmology and most other areas of medicine don't have clinical trials to back them up. So if you don't have macular degeneration, should you be on vitamins to protect your eyes in any way? And I think in most answers, that, that in most situations, the answer is we don't know. Mm -hmm. A lot of very good eye doctors will recommend things like fish oil and flaxseed oil for patients with dry eye, which again is not dry macular degeneration, but the more common irritated red foreign body sensation symptoms that lots of people get. Mm -hmm. uh, some questionable evidence that high doses of vitamin A and fish oils may help certain inherited retinal diseases like retinitis pigmentosa. But for a normal person who just wants to protect their eyes, my best guess, not having any data to back me up on this, is a one a day multivitamin because anything that keeps the rest of you healthy is probably good for your eyes too. Great. Um, so well, it's kind of along the same line. Um, are there are there good and bad foods for good eye health? Right. So at least in theory, if you have macular degeneration, if you eat very very healthy, maybe you don't need the ARID supplements, right? Maybe you get plenty of antioxidants from eating dark green leafy vegetables, kale, collard greens, egg yolks have a lot of that lutein and zeaxanthin in them. But I think the point of the, of the supplement combinations of the AREDs and other ones is that realistically, most people don't eat such very healthy, balanced diets. Right, right. Uh, next question is, uh, what are the signs of cataracts? Is it gradual? Most patients who have cataracts have a gradual slow change. And in my experience, the two things that, that usually bring somebody to a doctor are reading very small prints or driving at night, right? The street signs far away, particularly at night. So those, those tend to be the earliest things to go wrong. Uh, many, many patients with cataracts will report worsening glare or halos around oncoming headlights while driving at night. But usually the sort of thing that happens slowly and gradually, very few people go to sleep one night with perfect vision and wake up the next morning with a cataract. It's very, very unusual. Okay. Um, our next question is, uh, does a black spot in the front of your eye relate to macular degeneration or cataract? Well, so again, um, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to know for sure, just based on symptoms, based on what the patient reports, but most eye doctors, think that macular disease, including macular degeneration, but there's plenty of other macular diseases, uh, will, will start with distortion. So you can either use that Amsler grid like I showed, which really looks like a piece of graph paper and see off the line still looks straight. But some patients will tell me that the door frames are bent, that trees that I know are straight look bent. 
especially if it's only in one eye and not in the other eye. So it's not that the tree bent over since the last oh. time I saw it. Whereas cataracts, again, are more of a diffuse problem. Everything's sort of out of focus. The colors aren't right. And of course, you can have both at the same time. So um, that raises a good question. Um, are cataracts and macular degeneration usually bilateral? Or can they be one side only? I would say usually bilateral, but they might not be symmetric, meaning you might not have the same level of disease in one eye that you have in the other eye. Uh, we have plenty of patients that only get wet macula in one eye and they don't seem to get it in the other eye for many, many years, if at all. It's not really understood why that is. Um, it does seem like sort of a 50-50 chance which eye is going to get it first. Uh, there's, there's really no good way to predict that. Uh, most patients who have cataracts, they're, they're closer to symmetric meaning that most patients who have typical age-related cataracts get them similarly in both eyes around the same time. And probably most, pa most patients get their cataract operations done around the same time. Most surgeons that I know of uh, are not fans of operating on both eyes for cataract surgery on the same day, but it's usually a week or two in between. So cataracts tend to be more symmetric, but macular degeneration really doesn't have to be. Okay, thank you. Um, how about, uh, does wearing sunglasses help? If so, what kind? So I think a lot of the evidence on sunglasses is, is, is iffy. Um, if you live in Florida, it's very bright out, right? It's probably a good idea to wear sunglasses for any number of reasons. Do sunglasses reduce the risk of cataract or macular degeneration? I, I, I don't know that that's really proven. I can tell you that most lens implants that are, that are given nowadays um, have ultraviolet protection already in them. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't still wear sunglasses. If nothing else, uh, it seems to me at least that wearing sunglasses would reduce the risk of skin cancers on the eyelids, which is a real problem. Hmm. Um, thank you. Um, we have uh, a question. Um, I took the AREDs uh, for two to three weeks, but the headache never went away. Which vitamin, which vitamin might be causing this? Right. So, so that's a good point, right? So when you hear people say it's just a vitamin, it can't hurt me, that, that really isn't true because people get funny reactions to vitamins. And the reason that we use the AREDS 2 combination instead of the original AREDS 1 combination is the AREDS 2 is a little safer for people that smoke or that used to smoke. Um, and, and again, there are, there are people that get what we call idiosyncratic reactions, meaning it's just you, for whatever reason, you got a headache from these vitamins. And it doesn't mean that your doctor knows why you got a headache from these vitamins. But if you take the vitamins and get a headache and stop taking the vitamins and the headache goes away, then it really sort of looks like the vitamins are causing it. So like I said, the original AREDS formula is patented by a company called Bausch & Loam. And that's the one that I showed the picture of. Uh, there's a, another company called Alcon that makes an identical product called ICAPS, I-C-A-P-S. Maybe that wouldn't cause the headache. Other than that, you can look at the individual ingredients and see if you can replicate that. Uh, there are many, many other formulas out there that are very close to the AREDS formula, but because the AREDS formula is patented, uh, most of them aren't exactly the same formula. Could you tell us what's in the AREDS 2 again? The AREDS 2 has lutein, which is an A vitamin, zeaxanthine, which is an A vitamin, vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, and copper. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, question I did not see, Ocavite medication mentioned, is it no longer effective? Right. So uh, for many years, I was a consultant to Bausch and Loam, and, and, and I used to serve on panels, consulting them on the, on the vitamins. And this is in the days when AREDS had come out, but there wasn't an AREDS 2, and they were still doing the AREDS 2 study, but they had all these extra vitamins that went under the name Occuvite. There was an Occuvite over 50, and that was really sort of meant from the company's point of view to be 
uh, just sort of the one a day vitamins for people that were a little concerned about their eyes and it was confusing. And I told them every time they, they brought me in, you got to get rid of these other ones, right? The, the, the AREDS is the one that went through the clinical trial. That's a, that's a precious thing, right? No vitamin ever really goes through a clinical trial and it shows benefit beyond the, right, a, 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 a statistically significant threshold. So, uh, you know, they, as far as I know, they, they may still sell various Occuvite vitamins, but the, the one you want, if, you're, if, if you've got macular degeneration, is the AREDS or the AREDS 2 even better. And you really don't want those other ones. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's just confusing. And, and, and after I told the company that enough times, they, they stopped asking me to be a consultant. <laughs> A, a, a quick question. I have a quick question from, uh, this is mine. Um, what is the youngest person that you have seen macular degeneration in? Yeah, so, so you that, said it's great. It's a good question. So I can tell you from review of the Medicare database, which I've done right now that everybody's got electronic medical records, there are massive databases that sometimes people have access to. So the average age of first diagnosis of any macular degeneration in the U.S. is right around 71 years old. All right. So again, that means half of people are diagnosed before 71 and half are diagnosed after 71. The average age of first diagnosis of wet macular degeneration is right around 78. How young can you be and still get macular degeneration is uh, not entirely known. You'll hear different authorities give you different cutoffs. Many, many clinical trials for age-related macular degeneration have a cutoff of 55 years or older. So at least in theory, a 55-year-old might get age-related macular degeneration, but really if you're much younger than 65 or 60, you'd have to, you'd have to question the diagnosis. There are other diseases that affect the macula that look a lot like macular degeneration, but, but aren't really. And, and the and, and it's important to try to get the diagnosis right because the prognosis might be different. And there might be uh, there might be implications for heredity for children and grandchildren. Thank you. Um, uh, one of the questions is: You listed nutrition. Can you be more specific? I, I think nutrition is difficult, and I'm not a nutritional expert, but. We know that the nutrients that were found in the AREDS-2 combination, which are again, lutein, zeaxanthine, vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, and copper, at those doses that were studied in the trial, on average, reduce progression rates for patients with macular degeneration. So if you don't want to take vitamins and you want to do this the old fashioned way, then you want foods that have those nutrients. Mm -hmm. And again, not that I'm an expert in this, but the uh, <clears throat> dark green leafy vegetables, kale, collard greens, egg yolks tend to have a lot of these nutrients in them. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, my wife and I have the, have the lens that lets you see from your watch to the moon clearly. How does that lens work? Right. So... Uh, the human lens, we didn't talk about this, the human lens in the young person is sort of an amazing thing in the sense that it's got an autofocus mechanism, right? So young people, if they need glasses for distance, that's fine. But then young people can look at their watch or can read just fine, right? The, the eye autofocuses, the technical term for that is accommodation. Interestingly, the, the exact... Uh, scientific mechanism by which the eye accommodates is not well understood. Uh, but the best guess is that there are little muscles around the outside of the lens. We call that the zonule. The zonule exerts traction and it, and it physically changes the shape of the lens and that's how it autofocuses. So that's why young people may or may not need distance glasses, but they can pretty much all read. And then after about age 40 or 50 or sometimes into your early 50s, but not much longer than that, that accommodation or that autofocus goes. And that's inevitable. There really is no good treatment for that other than reading glasses. And that's why people get older. And the first thing they tell you is that their arms aren't long enough because they have to hold the paper. <laughs> right? 
Most lens implants after cataract surgery are single vision lenses. So they're focused at one lens, they can't accommodate. Uh, and again, most patients who get cataract surgery would like to see clearly at distance and are willing to wear over-the-counter cheap reading glasses. Uh, but for patients that are very, very motivated to not wear reading glasses, not wear distance glasses, and see from their watch to the moon clearly, there are a variety of so-called premium lens implants that work through different mechanisms. And the most common is what's called a multifocal. So have you ever known people who've had bifocal glasses or bifocal contact lenses? This is sort of like that. And the way this works is that the human eye, when we focus on something close as a reflex, not under our control, the pupil gets smaller. So the iris constricts, the pupil gets smaller. So it's the opposite of having your pupils dilated in the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. So to take advantage of this reflex that we all have, that the pupil constricts when we read up close, the lenses are constructed with multiple concentric rings. So it sort of looks like an old fashioned record for those of you that remember records and records, right. except instead of one you know, circle that goes all the way around in one circle, this is more an outer ring and a smaller ring and a smaller ring inside that, almost like a Russian nesting doll looked at from the side. And the near vision is in the, the, the center rings and the far vision's in the more peripheral rings. And the idea is that when you look far away, the pupil's wider and you get more of the distance vision correction in. And when you look close to something, the pupil constricts and that covers up the distance rings and it, and it only gives you the near rings. And for a lot of people, this seems to be very useful. Um, there are downsides to this. There are patients that don't tolerate these lenses well. I think we all know people that hate their bifocals, right? Need to wear separate reading and distance lenses. So. If you're considering doing something like this, you want to have a conversation with the cataract surgeon before the surgery. Cool. Um, are there any new procedures or drugs on the horizon for macular degeneration? There's always research. A lot of the research, unfortunately, was thrown off by the, by the COVID-19 pandemic. And now that that's winding down, we're hoping that it's, uh, that that'll pick up again. The big unanswered need in macular degeneration really isn't wet macula anymore, it's dry macula. And again, most people with dry macula do very well and maintain most of their vision for most of their lives, but there's a small number of people that get something called atrophy, right? It's specifically called geographic atrophy. And it's called geographic because if you look at a picture of a macula, there's an area where the color isn't quite the same. So I tell my patients, it's like an old stop sign that's been out in the sun for too long in Florida and it isn't red anymore, it's pink. Mm -hmm. This isn't the whole thing pink. This is an area in the center that turns pink. And it's not a perfect circle and it's not a square or a triangle. It's sort of an irregular jagged appearance and it almost looks like something you'd see on a map, like a Florida key. And that's why they call it geographic atrophy. There is no treatment for geographic atrophy. So at Bascom Palmer, my colleague, Dr. Jacqueline Kovac, is the lead investigator on a phase three clinical trial from a company called Ellis, which is a drug meant to slow down the progression of geographic atrophy. Uh, for those of you familiar with clinical trials, phase three is the last clinical trial. So if it makes it through stage three, and if it shows positive results, then then, you know, in theory, that's when the FDA approves it and it comes out there. So a lot of us are rooting for Apellus because if Apellus doesn't work, there really isn't anything close on the horizon. It takes many, many years for a drug to, to get through clinical testing. And uh, for people with atrophy from bad dry macular degeneration right now, Apellus looks like something that might help if it shows uh, effectiveness in the phase three clinical trial. Great. Um, I have a question here. Could you explain the differences between an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, and an optician? Sure. Right. And the words all sound the same. So it's uh, 
very easy for normal people to confuse them. So an optician is the person that fits and makes the glasses for you. And they're very knowledgeable. But at the current time in Florida and in most other states that I'm aware of, they don't do exams, they don't do any treatments. So an optometrist is somebody who graduates from college, goes to a four-year doctoral program in, a, in, a, in an optometric school. And in Florida, they're licensed to do exams, use dilating drops to prescribe most or probably all prescription eye drops for various diseases. And in Florida, they're allowed certain oral medications by mouth. Uh, in Florida, although not in all states, in Florida, optometrists are not licensed to do any sort of surgical procedures. And this is uh, sort of a hot area because this comes up in, uh, in, in state legislative issues. And actually right now in Florida, there's a bill that would, that would expand the scope of practice of, of optometrists. In comparison, ophthalmologists are medical doctors. They went to undergraduate school. They went to four-year medical school. Uh, so they have either an MD or a DO, which is a doctor of osteopathy degree. So just like physicians, surgeons, obstetricians, gynecologists, pediatricians, we all did the same program. And then after that, an ophthalmologist does an internship and a residency, which is another four years of postgraduate training. And most ophthalmologists, certainly at Baskin Palmer, and actually most ophthalmologists that are practicing in Naples and Fort Myers did voluntary extra postgraduate fellowship training for subspecialty, which is usually surgical training. So an ophthalmologist is a medical doctor that went to medical school, did postgraduate medical training, just like all other medical doctors. The other groups. Um, sorry, that, that, that answers my question really well. Uh, we have another one here. Is there any treatment for PVD floaters carried out in Naples, or is it something you have to just learn to put up with? Right. So the middle of the eye is filled up with a jelly called vitreous. And the vitreous is alive, and at some point, the vitreous collapses on itself. That's called a posterior vitreous detachment, or a PVD. Most of the time, it's just a nuisance with a variable degree of floating spots and flashing lights. Every once in a while, a PVD causes a retinal detachment. So that, that's a very bad thing. So people with new flashing lights and floating spots probably have a PVD, but they really need an exam. And that exam should be with either an ophthalmologist or an optometrist because we need to figure out if you're the 99% that just has a PVD and is gonna be fine, or if you're the 1% that has a torn retina or a retinal detachment and now is a major problem. Now, assuming you're in the 99% and you don't have a tear and you don't have a detachment, the floaters never really go away. There's nowhere for them to go. So they stay there forever. But most people can learn to live with them. Most people, their, their brain, can filter them out. They're really not quite as troublesome, but there's a small number of people that, that they hate it, right? They really can't make peace with it and it gets in the way of what they do. So there are different schools of thought about what to do with these patients. When I was in my training 20 years ago, there was no treatment. Patients were told to live with it and go home. Uh, what, I, what I think most people are doing now for the rare patient that really wants treatment and really understands the risks and benefits is it's possible to physically remove the floaters with a surgery called a vitrectomy, which is real surgery with real sharp instruments inside the eye. It will get the floaters out, but there's small risks of infection, bleeding, retinal detachment, other surgical risks. There's a growing interest in using laser, which is non-invasive and theoretically safer to break up the floaters. Mm -hmm. I don't personally do that treatment. Uh, there are reputable people that do it. I, I just don't think it's as helpful. I think from what I've seen, it tends to take a big floater and turn it into lots of little ones. Obviously some patients find some benefit with that. So that's why there are people that get this done. But you know, if, if you're really, really bothered by your floaters and you really, really want to talk to somebody, then what, what usually gets offered, you know, once everybody's clear that we all understand the risks, 
is a surgery called a vitrectomy that will remove the floaters. Thank you. Uh, are you currently conducting any research about macular degeneration cataracts? If so, is there a philanthropic need? Sure. Well, uh, you know, we're doing clinical trials in Naples at Baskin Palmer right now for emerging therapies and age-related macular degeneration. Uh, but, you know, the question about the philanthropic need is important because, uh, you know, by the time it gets to a clinical trial, there's been lots and lots of research leading up to that. But a lot of the early stage developments, there, there, there isn't funding for, and there never was funding for. So one of the things that, you know, that, that, that's really helped at Baskin Palmer and around the U.S. and around the world are philanthropic contributions for early stage clinical research. And we mentioned the drug Avacin, which is bevacizumab, and that, that was the direct benefit of philanthropic contributions to Baskin Palmer to a doctor named Philip Rosenfeld, who did the original clinical trials, unfunded other than the philanthropic donations, with Avastin. And Avastin was really a blockbuster home run of a drug. It went from a cancer chemotherapy that was supposed to be given in the vein for patients with colon cancer, and it became the number one most widely used anti-VEGF drug for eye diseases around the world. And that all started with a philanthropic contribution to Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. Thank you. Uh, 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 I, had a, I had a macular hole repaired with argon gas in 2003. Are they still using that treatment now since I got a cataract from it? Because back then 90% of patients did. Right. So I guess the we talked about how the macula is a part of the retina. It's the center part of the retina. And there's lots of bad things that can happen to a macula other than macular degeneration. And one of those things is you can get a hole in your macula and it, and it just sort of happens by itself. It's usually not an injury or anything that anybody did wrong. And to this day, most patients with macular holes are treated with vitrectomy surgery, like we talked about to remove the floaters. And a gas bubble, which, you know, we tell patients it's to push the hole closed. It's not exactly why it's used, but to this day, we still use a, a vitrectomy and a gas bubble and ideally face down positioning for at least a few days after the surgery. And yes, most patients that have a vitrectomy with gas exchange in the eye end up with their cataracts getting worse. So that, that is pretty much what we're still doing. For a little while, there was an injection drug called acroplasma, and it went into the trade name Jatria that in very select circumstances could occasionally close a macular hole with one injection. And we all, you know, saw a few successes with this, but I think that drug is mostly not being used anymore. Okay. Uh, next question, how long does a cataract surgery last? Well, again, I showed you Dr. Gibbons' case. Now, that, that might have been a you know, an especially smooth, quick case, but, but even, the, even the complex ones aren't too much longer than that, right? We, we played it twice during the video and that was the whole, the whole surgery. So again, when you consider that there are maybe 30 million blind around the world, mostly because they can't get to a surgeon, right? It's, 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 kind, of a, it's kind of a humbling thought. Mm -hmm. um, what is the relation to macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy. Right, so the, the three leading causes of irreversible visual loss in the United States are macular degeneration, which is a disease that, again, mostly affects the elderly, and diabetic retinopathy, which is a disease that only affects diabetics by definition, and a disease called glaucoma that we didn't talk about. So if you're you know, if you're worried about losing vision, right, if these, these, are the, these are the things that are most likely to get you. Um, patients with diabetes, after many, many years of diabetes, either type 1 or type 2, especially if the control isn't very good, can get damage to the retina. And it doesn't really look like macular degeneration. You can usually tell them apart. They can get macular disease. They can get what we call macular edema. Macular edema is a swelling of the macula. 
usually associated with some degree of bleeding inside the retina. Hmm. And most patients either get one or the other. You know, what I was taught as a medical student many years ago that you either got macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy and you wouldn't get both. Um, probably that's not true. Probably some patients do get both, but it's, it's unlikely. Um, and interestingly, diabetic macular edema gets better from anti-VEGF drugs, from the same exact anti-VEGF drugs that treat wet macular degeneration. So if you know patients with bad diabetes in the eyes, uh, there's a good chance of being treated with the exact same medications, Avastin, Lucentis, Ilea. Great. Um, uh, you might have already said this, but I'm going to ask it again. It says, um, have you, I've read that kale <clears throat> and spinach are good foods for eye health. Is that true? Kale, spinach, carrots, right? They all have these, these, these antioxidant vitamins in them, so... Okay. The answer is your grandmother was right. Carrots probably are good for you. <laughs> if you, if for some reason you don't want to take the A-Reds vitamins and you want to do this through diet, you want foods that are rich in antioxidant vitamins. And usually dark green leafy vegetables are the, are the ones. Okay. Um, what inspired the design of the Naples building? Looks like a cruise ship do all your officers look the same? Well, you know, the, the building in, in Miami is, is from the 70s. It was, it was state-of-the-art design in the 70s, but it's, uh, and, and it's still a beautiful building, but I think it's showing its age. Um, I always personally thought that the Naples building looked more like a building at Tomorrowland than the Magic Kingdom. A cruise ship, cruise ship works too. You know, we very happy with the architecture firm. It's, it's a light, airy, you know, I'm there now and you can kind of see all the light that's pouring in through the, through the windows, but it's, uh, you know, we wanted it to look modern. We wanted it to look technologically advanced. Um, we only have two more questions. Um, one is, are yellow lenses effective for night driving and cloudy days? A lot of patients like that amber color because it cuts down glare and it, and it works either during the day or in the evening. And, and there's certainly no harm trying the amber lenses. You know, that's that same color that you see people use for skiing or outdoor target shooting or something like that. So that's sort of an easy, cheap thing to see if that cuts down on glare symptoms. Um, a lot of patients will tell me that they lose their golf ball in flight and they don't want to use the yellow golf balls because only old people play with the yellow. <laughs> so if you have the yellow glasses, yeah. they use the white golf balls. I like to paint mine orange, so. Um, last question. If you have cataracts, do you only need to do it once? Right. Most patients, cataract surgery is once per eye per lifetime. That's probably 99 out of 100, right? There's always surgical complications and things that happen later on in life. And unfortunate patients that for whatever reason, the lens implant needs to be exchanged or removed. But for the vast majority of patients, it's once per eye per lifetime. I'm glad for that. Um, thank you. That's all our questions today. I, I really appreciate your presentation. I've gotten, uh, I'm sure we've gotten a, a great deal out of it. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Schwartz for his presentation and thank all of you for joining us. Remember, there'll be a short survey at the end of our presentation. Uh, our next presentation, Eat Better, Live Better, is next Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Uh, Deb Logan, Executive Director, Southwest Florida Blue Zones Project. Dr. Schwartz, thank you very much. I appreciate it.